Hi, I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock Live right here on YouTube and Facebook. It's my pleasure being back. Did you miss me over the Easter holiday? I missed you maybe a toast, maybe just a smidge. Let me know in the comments where you're joining us from this evening and I'm going to shout you out. Are you in Jamaica? Are you abroad? What part of Jamaica are you in? How was the Easter? I want to know. We've got to catch up. We've been missing for a week. Of course, remember to please like the video, subscribe to this channel, and let your friends know that we are live right now. Of course, also subscribe to the newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. Now, come on, let's get this money. Kingston Properties is seeking to raise 2.25 billion Jamaican dollars in an additional public offer priced at $7.50 a share. The offer opened April 19 and is scheduled to close May 10. Is this investment right for you? CEO of Kingston Properties Kevin Richards joins us. And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Results are out for Price Mart, which is listed on the NASDAQ in the U.S. Locally, AMG Packaging and Paper is also posting results. How did they perform? And the world's richest man, Elon Musk, has made a massive offer to buy Twitter and take it private. But will Vanguard's sudden 10% purchase throw a wrench into his plans? We'll discuss. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Bookers, your best interest at heart. The Twitter drama continues to evolve with co-founder Jack Dorsey now taking aim at the company's board of directors. The former CEO said the board has consistently been the dysfunction of the company. Dorsey is still on Twitter's board but has indicated plans to leave once his term expires at the 2022 meeting of shareholders, which is scheduled for late May. All this comes as the company's board is considering Tesla CEO Elon Musk's $43 billion offer to buy the company and take it private. Musk offered $54.20 U.S. a share, well above its current value of roughly $47 U.S. In response to Musk's bid, Twitter adopted a limited-duration shareholder rights plan, often referred to as a poison pill to help fend off a potential hostile takeover. The rights plan would allow other shareholders to buy additional shares at a discount if any person or group acquires ownership of at least 15% of Twitter's stock without the board's approval. Musk, who is the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, already owns a 9.2% stake in Twitter. At the time, Musk's purchase made him the largest shareholder in the company. However, that was short-lived as the Vanguard Group quickly became the largest institutional shareholder, acquiring a 10.29% stake in the company. Elite Diagnostics climbed to $3.84 to close out last week as one of the JC's biggest gainers. The stock almost recovered to its three-month high of $3.90 after trading around the $3 mark since February. The increase followed news that the company's chairman, Stephen Gooden, had acquired some 35 million shares in the company. Gooden's acquisition bumped him to the company's third-largest shareholder. Majority of Gooden's shares were reportedly acquired from Excel Investments, which had owned roughly 37% of the company. The trade means that Gooden now owns 10% of Elite behind Excel and NCB Capital Markets. Gooden is also CEO of NCB Capital Markets, but told the Gleaner that the purchase was made in his personal capacity. Blue Dot Insights has found a new partner in the Grace Kennedy Group. Grace Kennedy says it now has a majority shareholding in the company. Blue Dot is a research and data intelligence consultancy which uses data collection and analytics to inform business insights and decision making. Speaking on taking stock in February, Blue Dot CEO Lauren Peart said that the company was weighing an initial public offer or taking on a private equity partner. This will be Blue Dot's second attempt at private equity investment as the company had previously sold majority of its shares to the troubled SSL Venture Capital. GK said it will not be directly involved in the management of Blue Dot and Peart will remain as managing director. Peart told Taking Stock that he wants to expand the company's regional footprint, having already established an office in Trinidad and Tobago. Price Mart says membership at its much-anticipated second Jamaican store has surpassed expectations. The new store in Portmore cost an estimated $3.1 billion or $20 million U.S., 
Mayor of Portmore, Leon Thomas, said the store has also created job opportunities for residents. 65% of its 180 employees live in Portmore. Price Smart, which is headquartered in the U.S., operates shopping warehouse clubs in Latin America and the Caribbean, selling goods and services at low prices to members. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Spurtree stock is up 300% in just three months since its IPO. And Fesca stock is up 1,000% since IPO a year ago. $10,000 invested in Fesco a year ago would be worth $100,000 today. And while these results aren't guaranteed, you need to learn how to start investing so that the next opportunity doesn't miss you. Take my Investing for Beginners Masterclass and learn the basics about stock market investing, how to decide what to invest in, and how to get started at kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. But wait, there's more. Get my broker guide, stocks tracker, and free access to my newsletter when you subscribe today. Go to kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back. Welcome back. Let me pick up all people here for the early warm. Adrian Legister is checking in from West Milan. He says, let's get this money. I like that you know what time it is, Adrian. Natoya Willis is checking in from Gordontown, St. Andrew. C. Ben Henry says, Mandeville in the house. Big up Mandeville. And Jamar Hughes is from West Milan. So big up everybody all around the country in tune to us live right now and all around the world as well. Where in the world are you from? Well, as you know, tonight's show is primarily about the Kingston Properties APO, stands for Additional Public Offer. Let's get an overview of the offer is seeking to raise up to $2.25 billion through an additional public offer. The company, which is listed on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange, will be selling up to 300 million new shares if upsized. All shares are going for $7.50 each, and the smallest quantity you can buy is 1,000 shares. That means you can participate in this offer for 7,500 Jamaican dollars plus fees, or about 48 U.S. dollars. The offer opened today, April 19, 2022, and is scheduled to close on May 10, 2022, but it could close early. The lead broker is VM Wealth Management. Seeking to raise up. All right, so there you have an overview, and there are also several selling agents, but we'll hear more about it. So you can apply through VM Wealth Management, and they have uh, an IPO platform online and several selling agents as well. But let us hear all about this offer from the man himself. He's the CEO of Kingston Properties, Kevin Richards. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me as usual, Kalila. How are you doing? Hopefully making that money for all my shareholders. <laughs> I get you. Yes, yes. I see you've been making the rounds as well. I was watching you on another YouTube program earlier. And mm. yeah, yes. I'm wishing as you I said, I can talk about KP for hours. Absolutely. As you should. As you should. It's your company, man. Okay. So before we get into it again, let me get an overview of the company. So let's see. Let's learn a little bit more about Kingston Properties. Imagine being able to own a piece of this, or this, or even this. For so many, owning a piece of commercial real estate is an unattainable dream. But lucky for you, with us, anything is possible. And not only is it possible, we make it very easy. At Kingston Properties Limited, our mission as the premier real estate investing company in Jamaica was born out of a vision to give every Jamaican, no matter who you are or where you are from, the opportunity to think, act and be an owner. Hi, I'm Kevin Richards, CEO of Kingston Properties Limited. Here at KP, the goal is simple. We allow individuals and institutions with the purchase of our shares on the Jamaica Stock Exchange to buy local and own global. And since 2008, we've been doing just that. Here is a Kingston Properties story. Kingston Properties was formed in May 2008, but back then we were known as Carlton Savannah Reed. Starting out with just one property in 2008, 
we have grown to own and manage 15 properties in three countries, representing over 450,000 square feet of commercial real estate. Kingston Properties grows larger and stronger, and our shareholders grow right along with us. In January 2017, the company acquired its first property in the Cayman Islands. Today, we own an iconic office building in Georgetown overlooking the harbor called Harbor Center. Eight industrial units and soon to add three more in the industrial belt in Cayman. And our flagship mixed-use multi-tenant property on the world-famous Seven Mile Beach Stretch Tropic Center. As we grew and acquired new properties, our shareholders have been reaping the rewards. Since our first rights issue in 2015, when our stock price was the equivalent of $3.50 per share, adjusted for a stock split in 2017, our price has risen by more than 160%, with over US $2.7 million paid out in dividends. Real growth, real rewards. This is the KPUA. So that's a nice overview of uh, of KP REIT, Kevin. You're yeah. the star of that show. And let me see Richard here saying Miami loves KP REIT. So I'm sure Kevin is very happy to hear that. Everybody else, let's see how much Kingston loves KP REIT after uh, after this, uh, this this APO closes, Kevin. All right. So we've gotten the overview of what you guys do, how you make money, basically. Tell us why you've decided to do an APO at this time. So, Kalila, I think this is about our fourth raise um, since inception. We had our IPO back in 2008, and we did a rights issue in 2015, another one in 2019. I think we spoke about that way back two and a half years ago. One of the things that came out of it is that we found that a lot of persons want to buy KP shares, and out of those issues, and even with a stock split, people weren't able to get shares in the company. So it was a no-brainer for us to go the route of an additional public offering where in typical KP fashion, what we are, what we do, let, let's make, establish this from day one. We democratize the ownership of real estate investing assets. We not only give you the access to it, but we make sure it's rewarding for you. So we basically are democratizing real estate ownership. If you're not able to offer shares to everybody, a widest cross-section of persons, then we're really not fulfilling our purpose. So we decided to do an APO that way anybody who wanted to buy whatever volume they want could actually come in and purchase shares in the company. You know, a lot of people don't realize that we don't have a lot of shareholders. Um, you know, we have just about 700 shareholders. We'd love to have a wider cross-section of Jamaicans or persons overseas owning KP shares. Do you find that your shareholders now are mostly institutional? Incredibly so. I, I think we're about 90% held by institutions. Wow. I would love, yeah. Um, and institutions tend not to let go of shares, especially. Right. Good, good companies, if I should say that myself. Right. But that's because, well, you said institutional investors, they like the real estate companies because they, they, they consider do. it to be uh, reliable, stable. You pay dividends on a timely basis. So institutions would like a company like yours. But why do you think the retail investors haven't uh, grasped on as strongly as you would like? I think a lot of persons don't really understand real estate. Um, their concept of real estate is their primary home, which to my mind, that's not an investment asset that really is shelter. But there's a reason why institutions buy real estate assets because, for example, in times of high inflation, it's the most resilient asset class there is. Performance over the long term, it's still the best performing asset class over the long term. And in terms of giving you a risk um, adjusted return, it is also one of the best options to consider. So that's always been something that a lot of institutions are focused on. The other important factor too with real estate is that you tend to need a lot of cash, a lot of outlay to acquire right, real estate. Yeah. And that's why a lot of individuals have never looked at real estate as an investing asset. And that's why somebody, a, a company such as KP REIT or any REIT, for example, is an avenue for persons with small amounts of money can actually participate in a real estate asset. Uh, I mean, we, we just played the overview just now, you know, think about it, a particular building that you've seen around town, you know, in New Kingston or in Cayman Islands or in Florida, 
you can actually own a piece of that by buying shares in KP. So this is a way of getting small investors to participate in a very resilient asset class. Now, you say you say KP REIT, right? REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. Trust. And I know you've modeled yourselves off REITs in the United States, but yeah. REITs don't really exist in the true sense in Jamaica. You don't get the same tax benefits, for example, Correct. as you would if you were a REIT operating in the United States. So why this particular business model for your company? Well, it's, it's simple. As I said, we want to give small investors access to real estate assets. And you're right, there isn't any REIT legislation in Jamaica. Um, I think over time we will get to that stage because it really is a simple process. We already have a framework with it, with our collective investment schemes. So it's easy to adapt it to, to, to get REIT legislation going in Jamaica. But it's not just about the tax benefit. I mean, it is the returns. You also want to look at diversification because, you know, if you have a portfolio, you may have stocks in your portfolio. You may have some sort of fixed income or bonds in your portfolio. You need to have real estate as a balance. And as I said, for a smaller investor, you are not able to participate in real estate typically because you need to have a lot of cash available. This allows you to participate and get the diversification, you know, the management of risk because of that said diversification. And believe me, it, it gives you a lot of pride when you can actually walk past a building and say, hey, I own a piece of that building. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's yeah, absolutely right. But all right. So I have so many directions that I can go with this conversation. But let me okay. go with this one first, since we're on the matter of REITs. One of the, the benefits of being a part of a REIT in the United States is the dividend policy. Mm -hmm. REITs are legally obligated in the U.S. to pay out, I think it's a minimum of 90%. Up to 90%. Of, 90%. Up to? I thought it was a minimum. Um, yes. of, of profits, is it? I don't remember exactly. Of profits, yeah. Of profits as dividends. What's yeah. your policy there? So what we've decided to do is to tie our dividend policy to the generation of cash in our business. And that is through a, an item that we call funds from operation, which essentially is how much cash we generate in the business. And we pay up to 90% of our funds from operation as dividends. Just to give you some sort of context, last year, our funds from operation was just under $1.4 million. And we paid out about $900,000 of that as dividend. Less than, less than 90% because we are in growth phase. But... At, we've been consistently about two thirds of funds from operation over the last three years in terms of our dividend payout to our shareholders. And what's your dividend yield? The yield is about 2.3% if you base it on our year and close price of $9 last year. But if you're going to base it on our offer price of $750, then you know, it's closer to 3, you know, 2.7, 2.8% thereabouts. We, we do a lot of comparison with you know, U.S. REITs, because we measure ourselves, although the legislation doesn't exist, we measure our performance against the performance of U.S. REITs. And when we look at a composite of U.S. REITs that sort of mimic our portfolio, their dividend yield is about 3%. So we're, we're somewhat in line with what REITs, in terms of a dividend yield that we pay out to our shareholders. The other thing to note with dividend yield, too, is that, you know, our stock price isn't static. You know, we had a 24% growth in our stock price last year. So, you know, if you look at what our total return, that's when you look at the growth in the value of the stock, as well as how much we paid out in dividends. When we do the comparison with a number of stocks listed locally, we've outperformed all of them, certainly all of them that play in the real estate space. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the issue of your stock price and how it's performed, because a lot of local investors, retail investors in particular, might be shy about participating in an APO because previous APOs in terms of return on investment or appreciation of the stock price haven't done that well. <laughs> I'm not saying the companies haven't performed well, but in Jamaica, company performance doesn't necessarily equate to stock price performance. And so they would have purchased other APOs, like you had the JMB, you had Proven, you had uh, Derrimon is another one. And the stock price hasn't really moved since the APO. And so what do you say to investors who might be timid because they're like, oh, APOs are just overhyped? Yeah, I, you know, one, one glove doesn't fit everybody the same way. Um, that's one thing I'd say to it. 
The other thing is that, you know, there was another APO that I can think of. I think it was Barita, which did very well for its participants or persons who subscribed to that. That is true. Yes, that's a good example. So, so Anna, and they had two APOs, if if my memory serves me right. Mm -hmm, So I I don't think we can... And the rights issue. And the right. I don't think we can definitively say that, you know, there's something negative about APOs in terms of how the stock price will perform because you have, you know... Barita that did well, okay, maybe another company stock price can perform as well. But you have to look at why that is the case. And you raise a very good point, Kalila, because it is actually a pet peeve of mine, is that when you look at companies, you know, let's say in the US, for example, you know, when a company does very well, puts out great revenue, great profits, you know, pays good dividends, that stock price goes up because of those fundamentals. Um, I'm not Sure, that is necessarily something that happens a lot here in Jamaica because some of those companies that you've you've mentioned who had APOs had very good results, um, and there needs to be a big conversation about why those stock prices didn't perform as maybe some persons would have expected. Um, you know, when we looked at our stock price, for example, since we did our last raise two and a half years ago, you know, the top performing stock over that period, you know isn't a company that has performed as well as JMB, for example, um, but it was the best performing stock over the last period. So I, I think there needs to be a larger conversation about, you know, how stock prices move. I'll, I'd leave it at how stock prices move in, in Jamaica. Mm, that, that's a great point. I, that's definitely a conversation that we need to have in general. Let me move to the first question from the audience. Inspiration wants to know, how will this dilution affect the company's earning per share? Earnings per share. Well, explain dilution. That's the question I, I would ask. You explain it. Well, so, so with so, an NPO, existing shareholders are diluted. No, you're diluted if you don't participate. Right. And that can happen with a rights issue as well if you don't participate. And it can happen as well if you already own shares in a company and decide to sell a portion of your shares in that company, you will be diluted, as in you own a smaller percentage of the company. Is that is that the correct understanding of what dilution is? Right. So, yes, if you're an existing shareholder and the company is now offering more shares, creating additional shares for sale, if you owned for argument's sake, five percent in the company and their your, your, your sh- existing shares will now become maybe 2% or 2.5% or whatever. If you don't participate. Unless you participate to bring correct. yourself back up to the 5%. So, so you should so, be buying, correct? So how would it affect earnings per share is the question. So so it it I, I know where that question is going, but the, the flaw in the assumption is that, remember, we're raising money. We're raising money to go and invest and generate additional profits. So, you know... It, if you're generating higher profits because you've increased your equity, then, um, you know, you you can't assume necessarily that their EPS is going to fall because at the end of the day, you've taken that money to invest it, to generate profits. So I I don't think there is any way to, I, I would never ever say that, that your EPS is going to be diluted because of a raise. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that question is. Where All right. the question. Since you since you brought it up, we, we have to go there anyway about what the AP, APO is for. Because you mentioned that uh, r- that we should remember that you are raising money for a particular purpose, and this purpose right. is intended to grow the company. So Kadari wants to know how does the company plan to utilize the proceeds of the APO? You get your right. whole two point two five billion dollars. What are you gonna do with it? Well, providing we're upsized, um, right. um, that's, a, that's a very good question. So last year, we borrowed $700 million um, as a bridge financing to acquire some assets, um, which you know some of those assets have been doing phenomenally well for us. And we hope to pay out the proceeds, from, pay out that loan from the proceeds of this raise. Outside of that, um, additionally, we're looking to acquire new assets and as well to develop two properties that we acquired last year. One is a property in the Crossroads area and the other one is a property in New Kingston, um, largely because of the kind of demand that we're seeing for space um, and the types of spaces 
that people are demanding. We're, we're looking to do, you know, what I'd say our first greenfield project in those two locations. And as we've always done, we go out and search out for the best deals, you know, look for what we call value add deals, which is properties, whether it's, you know, an industrial property that is like a warehouse, for example, an office property or multifamily space, which is something that we've gone into in the last year that has also done very well for us. We look at those, what we call value add opportunities. So those are types of properties, for example, that are probably in very good locations and the property perhaps needs some improvement, um, you know, improve the tenant base and that way you can improve the value of that property. And from that, that's the strategy we've been using for the last five years, which is, you know, in 2021 allowed us to return to shareholders an, an ROE of above 9%, 9.6% if you look at our average equity. And we're looking to acquire more of those properties. Once we continue to do that, I mean, my board has given me a mandate in terms of what my target ROE has to be. Once I'm hitting that target ROE, then what, I'm going what's to- What's the target? It's between eight and 10%. Um, so if we did almost 10% last year, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to try and try and hit 10% again this year. Once we're doing that, then we're obviously generating more profits. And it don't matter what the number of shares are. If you're generating more profits, then it's going to mean more dividends back to you as a shareholder. And the stock price you know, is going I to... I believe we have some footage of some of the properties that you are that you own and have developed so let's run that and yeah. you can tell us what we're looking at kevin so that is a eighty-eight thousand square foot warehouse property that we bought out of the proceeds of the last raise that we did two and a half years and we bought that sort of in the midst of the pandemic um best time to be buying properties that's our flagship property that's our reddles road what i call headquarters building um this is eight units of a warehouse building that we have in the Cayman Islands that has done very well for us. Um, a property that we own on Spanish Town Road, um, one of the first value add buildings that we bought. And this is Tropic Center, our first acquisition in the Cayman Islands. Again, another asset, that, that asset that's doing really well for us. Okay, finance with lands, and you might have answered this already, but I'll ask it anyway. What new projects does Kingston Property have on the way? Yeah, as I mentioned before, there are two, two properties that we acquired last year that we're going to be developing. One is a crossroads, a property in the crossroads area that we're going to be developing into what we call small bay warehouses. Those are like mini warehouses. Because what we found is that there is a huge demand for persons who want smaller spaces, either for purely as a warehouse space, you know, for storage, um, you know, warehousing or whatnot. Or there's some people who are using them as flex spaces. Um, so it's like a combination of office and warehouse or office warehouse and storefront. Huge demand for that. Um, you know, you, you really find mainly a lot of large warehouses. And, you know, there are many small businesses that need small warehouse space. So there's a huge demand for that. And we're going to be developing that property to do multiple units in that space. The other one is that we're looking to do a multi-story office mixed-use building in the New Kingston area, close to the uh, the other office building that we have in New Kingston. Again, because there is a demand for persons who want, you know, sustainable buildings. You know, we, we are all very concerned about the future of the environment. And if we don't take care of it, then there will be nothing left for us to enjoy. So we're looking at building a green building, you know, one that is takes into consideration the use of natural resources, whether it is sunlight, you know, flow of natural air, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we realize it's a very important thing that we, you know, we consider airflow in office place or in enclosed spaces. Just yeah, especially fit. now after the pandemic. Precisely. And if you think about it, bulk of the buildings that were built are, are in existence now in New Kingston, for example, well, anywhere in, you know, across Jamaica. They were built, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, they weren't being built considering, you know, airborne diseases such as what we've gone through over the last two years or so. So we're, we're, we're building for the future. So, yes, speaking of the pandemic, we are now hopefully on the tail end of it and winding down and, and getting back to normal. Absolutely. What are the opportunities that you see now? And perhaps you, you 
kind of alluded to it based on the properties that you are looking to invest in now. But where do you see the most upside in the next, say, five years? Are you looking at uh, Jamaica versus Cayman, United States, elsewhere, residential versus commercial? Where do you see the most potential right now coming out of COVID? Yeah. So so let me just tackle the easier is easiest one, which is the geog the geography. Um, we still think the U.S. is the largest and most important economy in the world and will remain that way for certainly for the foreseeable future. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. So we want to be in that market and we're going to continue to deepen our presence in that market. Um, we like Cayman a lot because one of the things that we, we, we saw is that economies that were growing at a fairly high pace pre-pandemic, we anticipate that they will continue to grow at a very high pace post-pandemic. Um, and Cayman is a market whose population has grown tremendously over the last 10 years. Um, and you know, once you have population growth and GDP growth, those are the kinds of economies we want to stay in. And we've actually seen very good performance from the assets that we acquired. We've, we've acquired in that jurisdiction. Jamaica is on a tremendous growth trajectory. And we're very familiar with Jamaica and very comfortable with that risk. So we're going to stay in those three jurisdictions. There are others that we're eyeing, you know, such as the DR, um, you know, is another one. Um, but I just think that, for example, the U.S., we haven't really tapped the surface of the U.S. You know, we've largely just been in South Florida, Southeast Florida, to be more specific. And there are other areas in Florida that we need to explore, other areas in the U.S. that we need to explore. So we're looking to deepen our presence in the U.S., now, mm. as you mentioned the pandemic, though, one of the things we saw, and most people saw that, is just the growth of e-commerce. And uh, once you had that growth, it means that everybody needed warehouse space. It, you know, the large operators needed more space. You had small operators entering into that space, so they need space as well. So we see the industrial segment to be the strongest performing sector over the next five years. The trend had started pre-pandemic, but I think the pandemic accelerated that. Um, we're looking at multifamily primarily in the U.S. because, you know, people got to live somewhere. And what we've seen is that particularly in a time of rising interest rates, persons would delay their purchases of a home, you know, because they'll wait until the cycle changes again and then prices go down. Um, then uh, once that happens, well, what we've been seeing is that, for example, rent growth has been tremendous over the you know, this period last two years, um, you know, particularly we, we like Atlanta um, as, 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 as an example. We also like North Carolina. We like Texas. We like Florida. We're seeing strong rent growth in that era, um, in those areas. So we'd like to continue um, to acquire assets in, in those areas, particularly in multifamily space. Industrial in the U.S. at this point. But, you know, if we can find a deal, we'd love to hit one. A related question coming from Kidari, what portion of the company's portfolio assets are held in Jamaica versus Cayman and the USA? Yeah, so so it it changes. It's never static. You know, we're always doing deals. Uh, keep his, <laughs> we'll probably be closing a deal in another few weeks <laughs> before this offer closes. But right as at the end of December, we're 51% in Jamaica, about 37, 38% in the Cayman Islands, and the rest is in the US. And that's spread between Atlanta and um, Southeast Florida. And then uh, another related one coming from Michael, pointing out that there are tons of opportunities in Guyana. He says, warehouse space in Guyana is in high demand, I imagine, with that oil boom that they are right. looking to experience. They're on the, the beginning part of that. That's right. And we've looked at some deals in, in Guyana as well. We haven't been able to strike on any of them yet, but um, in, we've looked at deals in the warehousing space, in the retail space, and in um, accommodations. Because um, what has happened is that you also, with Guyana, you have a lot of expats living in, in Guyana. So what, you know, there are huge opportunities for in the housing sector, for example, you know, for persons in the ex, who are expats to Guyana 
um, and that could give you a, a pretty decent return. But we just haven't been able to strike a deal on, on that just yet. Nathan wants to know, will you guys venture into real estate developments? And he's specifically asking townhouses, et cetera. If it's in Jamaica, categorically, no. I think there are lots <laughs> of experienced persons in that space. We will prefer to stay in the commercial space, that is warehouses and office. We know that market by the back of our hand would rather stick with what we know. There are lots of other competent people who are familiar with the residential market in Jamaica. So I'd leave that space to them. He said categorically no. <laughs> I like the confidence that that is not on the agenda. That's not us. That's not us. Uh, D21 Football wants to know, how do you plan to scale up in properties with KP? By this raise. You know, once we raise more money, then we can go out and acquire more assets. Now, there are two ways. One, we can acquire assets as one level. But we also prefer to do the value add type of asset, as I, I explained earlier. Once we go in and we buy a property and we fix it up and we change the tenant base, increase the rents, then the value of that property increases. So, so there are two ways of scaling up. is one, the acquisition of the property, but also the appreciation in the value. So that fair value gain, you know, if you look at our financials, you'll see that line item that says fair value gain. Those are the gains that we book from those properties that we've made improvements on, um, you know, and increased rents. Um, and that has resulted in higher profits so that we can and a higher you know funds from operations so we can pay out more dividends right so i have a question as well from michael who wants to know do you does capreet invest in or partner with private residential developments um again our only involvement in the residential space has has been in the us um and we do have a partnership now in um, in Atlanta, uh, when we acquired a 155 unit multifamily property, um, we did it as a partnership. Um, so we only have a, a 38, you know, less than a 40% stake in that. Uh, we've done it with a partner who is an ex experienced player in that market and in that space. So when we go into new markets, we'd like to partner with persons who know the ins and outs of that market, know all, have all the right connections. That, so, so partnerships we're open to. If we're talking about residential, it's it's more than likely going to be in the U.S. Um, as opposed to in Jamaica. All right. So we have quite a bit to go through and the questions just keep coming in. But let me try to ask you know one of my questions that I wanted to know after reading through the prospectus, because the results are out and the group recorded net profit of over three million U.S. dollars when compared to the previous year, which is 2020. The the year of the pandemic, the year the pandemic uh, started, started, yeah. started 2019, but the effects yeah. were really yeah. started to be felt really 2020. And that year, your net profit was 612,000 US compared to a year later, 3 million. So what contributed to that increase? What changed between 2020 and 2021 for this jump? Yeah, so we have to look at the financials in context. 2020 was an unusual year, um, you know, yeah, I mean, some of it is linked to the pandemic. The year prior to that, at the end of 2019, was when we did our last raise. We raised $2 billion Jamaican at the end of 2019. So we went into 2020 with higher Jamaican dollar balances than we anticipated. Um, we had deals lined up, but then the pandemic hit and we decided, you know, let's hold off. If, if you remember back in March... 2020, nobody knew what was going on or understood what the future looked like. So we decided to play cautious and we held off on doing any of those deals. So we, we held Jamaican dollar cash for far longer than we anticipated. And then, of course, the dollar devalued. So our, our financials are in U.S. dollars. So obviously we booked some foreign exchange losses. Um, and that's the kind of context you have to take into consideration for 2020. We made acquisitions also in 2020 because, you know, once we decided that, you know what, yeah, the world's not going to fall apart, we still have to live. So we went ahead and we made two acquisitions. One was a multi-story office building in the Cayman Islands. That's a Harbor Center building, which was fully tenanted at the time and remains fully tenanted. Um, the other acquisition was that industrial property on East Ashenheim Road that we mentioned earlier. 
So if you're compare, we made those acquisitions in the middle of 2020. So for the full year of 2021, we would be recording all of the income from those two properties, as well as income from the other properties that we had in the portfolio, because, you know, things have started to turn around quite a bit in 2021. So that would, you know, so there are two things to consider if you're looking, if you, when you want to think about the jump in profits 2021 over 2020. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, a lot of people have been asking now, how do they actually participate in this offer? What are the channels to do so? Shane Edwards said, I'd love to be a part of this. Where can I come? What's the next step? What do they do? All right. So you can speak to your brokers, but you know the lead broker for this offer and lead broker and arranger and part underwriter is Victoria Wealth Management Limited. And they have a platform called Wealth IPO. Uh, which you can register on and subscribe to the shares. But we also have five selling agents, and we're very happy for the support that they've given us in this process. That's Sagicor Investments, JMB, um, JN Fund Managers, Scotia Investments, and Barita. So you can always contact, I think you can use JMB's portal as well um, and cut or contact any of those brokers if you want to subscribe. Um, do read the prospectus, you can get the prospectus. From our website, kpreit.com, or if you go on any of the broker's website, you can access the prospectus and it lays out how you may subscribe. I mean, I think there's an application form in there as well if you want to do it paper form, but you know, most people are going the route of the, the platforms. Right. Thank you so much, Kevin. And for our viewers, I'm going to put the links in the description box. If it's not there, it should be there already. If not, I'm going to put them there right now where you can download the prospectus and also a link to the Wealth IPO, to VM, VM Wealth's IPO platform. So you can yep. just click it and go straight there from the description box here on YouTube or Facebook. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Kevin, for joining us and all the Thanks best. Thanks a million for having me. Reminding you viewers that the APO opened today. So it is already open. It's scheduled to close the 20th of May. But like I always tell you, don't watch the close date because it could close earlier than that if you are interested in this particular offer. Stay with us. Your market recap is up next and the analysts are standing by. Making Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. The JSE Combined Index declined by 1,800 points or about half a percent. 118 stocks traded across the main and junior markets for the week, ending Thursday, April 14, 2022. 51 advanced, 56 declined, and 11 stayed the same. Nearly 313 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $2.9 billion. Mayberry Jamaican Equities was the most traded, taking up nearly 25% of market volume, with people buying and selling nearly 78 million shares in the company. The stock was also last week's third biggest gainer, up 30%. Maybury Jamaican Equities price rose $2.89 to open on Tuesday at $12.44. Jamaica Stock Exchange traded the second highest volume. People bought and sold 48 million shares in the company. The stock's price gained 1% to open the new week at $23.05. And Jamaican Teas rounded out the most traded, taking up nearly 12% of market volume, with 37 million shares trading. The stock's price fell 2% to open this week at $3.40. Now let's see who had the biggest gains for the week. Elite Diagnostic jumped 38% to close last week at $3.57. The stock jumped following news that the company's chairman, Stephen Gooden, acquired more than 35 million shares in the company. Gooden is now the third largest shareholder, owning 10% of the company. And iCreate rose nearly 38% to open this new week at $1.24. It may be a nod of confidence from shareholders following news that its iCreate Institute digital training arm was approved as a business development organization with the Development Bank of Jamaica's Serve Jamaica grant program. On the losing side now, Kingston Properties was last week's biggest loser, down nearly 21% to open Tuesday at $7.51. The share price falls following KP Reed's announcement of an additional public offer, which opened today. Trans-Jamaican Highway JMD was the second biggest loser, down nearly 18%, to close last week at $1.45. And Trans-Jamaican Highway USD was down nearly 11% to close last week at $0.01 US. 
This segment of Taking Stock, the Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. Welcome back, welcome back. You can check the description box for the updates. I just posted them in there. So you can apply via VMWealth's IPO Edge platform. The link is in the description below. You can also download the prospectus there. I've just added the prospectus on YouTube. I'm going to add those two links on Facebook later on when the show is over. Right about now, though, it is time for the analysts. So let's see who we have today. Who is our esteemed analyst panel after Easter? Let's see. All right. We're joined by equities trader at JMMB Group, Clive Charlton, business writer at The Observer, David Rose, and financial coach, founder, and CEO of Profit Jumpstarter, Keisha Bailey. Welcome, everyone. Good Hi. Night, How was, was it good? Well, uneventful. Uneventful. That is the word I was looking for. Uneventful. Not nothing really happened. Just a lot of Easter. Well, Easter egg hunts. Very boring. Yeah. When you have yeah. kids, that, that's pretty much how mine was too. When you have kids, it's all about the kids. So no, no. I love soca, David. <laughs> <laughs> block up, block up sentence yes, <laughs> highway. I was downtown. But I no, 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 no. I am against downtown. I got a call. 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 I a when I want to just come to you, you don't go to parties. It was a you get different it done. kind of business. But, <laughs> but let me not get in your business. We have, okay. we have other business to talk about today. <laughs> a few things happened. Uh, it's a few eventful things, funny enough. Um, in the investment world, Twitter would. <laughs> There's a lot going on with Twitter. I'm looking forward to talking to you, Keisha, about that. But I want to talk to look first at the local scene. One of the big bits of news to come out over the past week was the acquisition of Blue Dot shares by GK. So you guys would remember that Lauren Peart was on this program a few weeks ago talking about he was considering an offer. I think he had already made up his mind by that point in time. And now he said that he would have news for us soon. And this is the big news. Uh, GK has now bought majority stake in Blue Dot. So, Clive, what do you make of this development? Uh, it is interesting. Um, I think it's uh, coming out of the, that issue with Stocks and Securities Limited. I think it's good for Blue Dot and the Mr. Peart, you know, um, because I think he was looking for the type of seed investor who could help his company along the way. And it didn't work out with stocks and securities, but I think he's in better stead now with a large one of Jamaica's largest, oldest conglomerate that just opened up a whole road of opportunity in terms of opportunity for business, but also capital injection and perhaps technical expertise. So I think it's really good for Blue Dot. It's also good for Grace. I think this has tremendous mm -hmm. potential for Grace. Grace can use this. Well, let me, I, I said use, but yes, Grace can take advantage of the synergies many many different types of synergies that this company offers for them you know and uh, I, I, well let me yes let me <laughs> don't hug up your this discussion <laughs> i've seen in the past like six months to a year grace has really been stepping things up yes because yes. they were the lead on spur tree right yes. um another recent one as well oh another yeah, jfp kalila Yes, JFP, yes. Spurtree okay, and JFP. Okay, right, yes, yes. And now here yes. they are with their involvement in, exactly. uh, in GK. Right. Sorry, Blue, Blue Dot as an equity yeah. investor. And then right. when the time comes for them to eventually IPO, exactly. seeing their, their presence felt very strongly yeah. there as well. Right, yes. And this, this is a different position. This is a private equity position. So this mm -hmm. position really is... Is it's a company that is not fully proven itself in the public space, you know. Um, it's a small entity that has a very diverse and very expansive uh, client base. When you look at their client base, they have um, significant international companies, regional companies. They have several public listed entities also as their client. 
and their product base is fairly diversified. I think the value to grace is not just revenue. Huh? Let me add done something. I sent it to you kind of late, but let me have a quick look at it. You know, it's what is referred to as a full service. This is what they've published: a full service research and data intelligence consultancy. And this is a new word to us. You know, here's what I want to say. And I, I, even people in, in the industry will have to keep saying this, that everything can make money. I don't like the word money. Everything can build wealth. Any activity that human beings can engage themselves into has the potential to generate wealth. And I think now that we're in the knowledge-based industry, we talk about IT, compute, and things related to that. Well, this is a little bit, a little step above. This really is about gathering data and intelligence. This is what Facebook does. This is how they make their money. Yeah, granted, they do it in some a slightly different type of way is your activity and that there are issues with that but these people they go out and they do their statistical research they gather their data for you and they are very broad based let me just quickly just to give you an idea of some of the things that they say they do and these are revenue generating areas and i'm telling you that we will understand it sooner or later as we get to understand this company and what it does but they do and these are some of the terms sound very medical you know our psy psychological psychographic segmentation huh? that is trends based on psychological traits such as attitude values and fears in an economy that like jamaica this is important you want to know your marketplace you want to know how people will see your products you want to know how people react to something that you intend to put on the market before you spend your money put it on the market and then fail huh? so you don't want to go through that stress and that high cost and this is what these people do they do product rebranding analysis huh? Now, if you look at Salada, a couple, probably up to a year and a half or two ago, Salada totally rebranded themselves. They changed the packaging on several of their food products. I think Grace did the same thing also, moving from that reddish color that was on the packaging of their products to a greenish package. You have to do your studies. You have to go into the marketplace. And Grace is very global. Huh? And Grace is, has perhaps hundreds of different products that they sell. So you can understand the type of data that is necessary, the type of intelligence necessary to really put yourself in the right place. You know, so this is where this company comes in. Customer experience and satisfaction survey, consumer usage and attitude study, and preference sensory test. These are some real different terms we're not used to. But I think the marketplace, just like with discuss KP Read, the market must understand that anything that human beings engage that has the potential to make a revenue. Right? And if you organize a business, structure your business, corporate governance is very important, then you can perhaps make it public one day or sharing that well through some public offering. And I think the Jamaican marketplace is waking up and will wake up further to the different opportunities that there is in the, the, the domestic economy. So now, yes, you can own property through um, a KP REIT, you know, a collective uh, uh, property development and ownership scheme. And now you can own into data-driven analytic type companies. That's what Facebook is. Huh? Mm -hmm. This is slightly different. You but know what like, I, I like is... about what I like about Blue Dot Clive is mm -hmm. that they have the potential to be a major global company. The yes. service that they offer isn't just a service for Jamaicans. It isn't just a service for Caribbean people. They yes. could be a major global player because they are an industry leader in what they do. I want you guys, anybody who hasn't watched the interview with Laren on Blue Dot from a few weeks ago, go back and watch that episode of Taking Stop where he explains what exactly it is they do and the edge yes. that they have over a lot of the competition globally. They could be the next big thing, a, exactly. a major brand coming out of Jamaica. Exactly. Some of their top clients are Campari, international company, Rupa de Azure, international company, Digicel, a fairly international company, and Total, the gas station chain mm -hmm. that, you know, Jewish, you know, originated in France, you see. Um, and they have several companies, JMB, NCBJ, and Group. You know, look at the diversified base, Caribbean Producers Group, Supreme Ventures, a gambling entity, Honeybun, Baking, KP, um, I think they're not so express. They are transportation and traveling company. So they are fairly diversified. But as I said, internationally, yes. Look at these international companies. These are reference companies that can use as reference that they have done. And interestingly, look at their board and their staff complement. There's a, there's a, like, um, I am not even sure, but this person in this psychiatric, psychological field, a trained person, you know, who does this type of mental analysis and testing. So it's really interesting, though, what they do and the potential that they have. But I can see them 
really impacting grace in a big way you know and um grace take yes it would have to be sufficient to give them some influence in the company of course grace as they stated the company already has its team well competent highly qualified team uh they've attracted international companies they don't want to mess with that but grace will inject capital in that company the stake is a little bit risky you know and they are not just bringing a company public they are really helping to develop and build out a company mm -hmm. that they hope one day to carry to the Jamaican marketplace and provide some new diversified uh, investment offerings. Right. And since the announcement, we also have an updated timeline for the IPO. Lauren has now said around mid-2023, sometime in 2023. I don't remember if he said mid, but he did say next year. On my show previously, he said like three to four years was his timeline. So now that they have signed, sealed, and delivered with GK, they've yeah. moved that timeline up. So sometime next year, look out yes. for that IPO. Uh, so... I didn't send you guys this question to prepare for, but you probably should have you probably should have known I would ask since we just did the interview with uh, KP Reed on the APO. So I hope that you at least were listening to the interview or maybe had a chance to skim the prospectus. But I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that APO. We could start with you, Keisha, if if you were able to, because I didn't I know you didn't prepare for this. I have read through the prospectus very thoroughly <laughs> because anything worthy yeah, of my yeah. money is after pay keen attention. So I, I personally like it. I'm speaking for myself. What I like is the direction the company is taking strategically. They're going into an area of digital logistics and expanding globally and regionally, which I think is going to be a big game, cha game changer for them when you look at profits. Digital logistics companies were less affected by COVID. They are the future. That's where we see a, a lot of the international companies going as well. And to be able to service real estate in those industries will be extremely profitable. I also like the fact that the company is expanding their dividend policy. That's going to be big. When we think about passive income, I want to have enough extra money to live an abundant life. Yes, um, that would be a major tick for me, seeing that passive income and seeing the, comp the company's focus on making sure that they're going to be having a very attractive dividend policy. I see it more of a very long-term type trade. It would be one of the core holdings I'd want to have in my Jamaican portfolio, just to get that real estate exposure, just to get that inflation hedge in my portfolio as well. And so I like it. Um, a good trade last week would have been, you know, selling at that 950 and then entering back at the APO price. But for those who don't hold it, definitely a good entry point at $7.50 for sure. And yes, my personal views are how I would attribute it. Mm -hmm. You know, we always have to put in the disclaimer. This yes. is not financial <laughs> advice. This is for information purposes only. Please consult your licensed financial advisor before making investment decisions. Right. Uh, David, what are your thoughts on KPAPO? Well, it's been offered at book value. So, you know, you're getting what's really the intrinsic value of KPAPO after you subtract all the liabilities. And it's a good step forward for KPRIT, you know, considering the targets that they've set you know, in terms of, you know, a 1 million square foot ownership target, the 10 billion JMD equivalent worth of equity. And the thing is, I don't think what I was mentioning the actual interview a while ago, it was in my article last week, whereby in the prospectus it said that if KPRIT had upsized target and there were still amounts of oversubscribed funds available, they would apply to the FSC to actually see if they could issue more shares based on the fact that they have such a large space between their issued share capital and their author share capital. But it's a pretty interesting offer, especially because the company wants, you know, to, for one, pay on that bridge loan from BM, BM Determination Investments Limited, uh, focus on finishing those investments in the Cayman, Crossroads, and, you know, Dumfries Road, and they're in a space at a time when it's the best environment to really be capitalized on the environment because interest rates are rising. Inflation numbers came out today in Jamaica and it was at 11.3%. In the US, it's at 8.5%. So they're, they're a bit of position right now to actually increase rental rates for some of their customers. Based on their customer base, they can afford it. We've seen some analysis come out of the broker terms already. So Barita says a price target of $8.39, participate. Uh, Scotia says $10.46, which is Scotia investments for those who are asking, I'm speaking about. 
which is the most aggressive price I've seen so far, and VM Wealth, which is actually the lead broker for the offer, said then dollars forty one. So it's good so far. We see recovery the brokers. We see what Capri's done over the years. So you can the company didn't get the best runway when it came to market back in two thousand nine or eight. So I'm pretty sure that you get fully subscribed. I'm not sure if it's put, hit the full two point two five billion dollar target, but I wish it seemed all the best. You know, as first actual age I went to uh back in April twenty seventeen. So I'm looking forward to what I see from Cape Prince. Rodney Hacker says seven fifty is fairly priced. And Lancera says, I sold my Cape Reach shares at nine forty nine last week. Looking to acquire an APO price, you go, Vanessa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make yeah. moves. Yes. Right. So, Clive, let me hear your thoughts on KP REIT. Well, the first, APO. yes. First, I think it's fairly priced. Yes. Um, and uh, it's property. Uh, it has a healthy balance sheet. Uh, for diversification pro process, I think it's important that we have. It is one of the first real estate investment company. Well, trust, you know, you gave the, Amer the strict American definition, fine. In JA here, ma market is just developing. And I think having a property-related company is very early. I think it's a very good thing. Uh, this is something that Jamaicans really and truly should consider. Um, they are really a little bit different from some of the other property-related companies. As he stated, in Jamaica, they are heavily more industry, uh, invested in um, commercial industrial type properties and I think that is where business and large value is you know um, so I think it's a fairly good company for the purpose of diversification uh, I think over time all the real estate related companies they are underpriced or under traded on the marketplace KP we got a big boost when it was just announced the price shot up to about nearly ten dollars and it has you know retreated somewhat that's okay that's normal price behavior right and the market but i think this provides some new opportunity for the investing public and it's long term consider it long term also naturally right being that it's real estate yeah. so another big story locally i saw this reported all over the press was elite diagnostic and we saw that in my market recap just now as well where elite share price was the or elite shares was the biggest gainer for last week pre-easter and that follows news that Stephen Gooden, who is the CEO of NCB Capital Markets, how, and also the chairman of Elite Diagnostic, has bought a 10% stake in the company, more than 35 million shares, I believe it is, uh, acting in his personal capacity, not on behalf of NCB. What's the play there now, David? So to clarify for one, Stephen only bought 35 million shares. He didn't buy more than that. I saw the actual trade. It was for two dollars fifty-seven, so it's eighty-nine point nine five million dollars spent on that actual trade for Stephen to get that nine point nine nine percent stake. And it kind of is interesting considering that Elite would have been set back in two thousand and eighteen, I believe, Feb early February, you know. And it's, the IP was two dollars. The image is in at two dollars fifty-seven, so. You know, it's a significant deviation between IPO price versus, you know, price paid for it now, call it almost four years later. So he gives a quote unquote opportunity right now, because the price is paid for it. And in essence, it's kind of interesting to see that he's taking such a bigger stake in the lead at this stage, especially, you know, as the country opens and, you know, he's, as a private investor, taking stakes in these companies, he has direct leadership in stakes in. Uh, so for context, Elite Diagnostic is an imaging service. For those who don't know, so MRI, fluoroscopy, CT scans. They have branches in Ligane, Holborn, Rona, St. Anne. And they're currently looking to find another branch to expand to. So they said they can have or so forth. Not just St. Anne, the hot Drax Hall, St. Anne. Oh, yeah. Like, like, oh, it's, yes. right beside, it's right beside the new Nostal Express. and Starbucks. And not Nostal, Nostal, Nostal Express, actually. It's actually right next to Nostal Express. You yeah, can so take a Nostal Express, come up. Then Nostford, then KFC, Starbucks, and that complex. Right can literally that walk two minutes away from it. It's literally two minutes away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stephen, I said, it's pretty interesting. The thing is, you saw the tweet that happened on Friday, and the market distracted even further on the diagnostic today. Like, it's actually reaching back to what you'd call, quote, unquote, pre-COVID prices, where nobody's getting kind of stuck all together. Like, just because the chairman bought such a significant stake in the company 
Yeah. 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 What you saw last week was a lot of inside, uh, sorry, trades between directors, connected parties, executives. Why? But those companies who are reporting, but they reported in March 31, the JC rules says that 30 days before your results are quote unquote due, sorry, 30 days before your results are actually due, you can't be trading the stock or the company. So that's why I said everybody in this last minute trading a rush to actually execute these trades. Because everybody's like, why would you get the shares now? But that's really what happened because the trade actually occurred. The trade had actually the trade wasn't completed by last week Thursday. It never happened until the res- results were published uh, around May 15 or whenever. So, like in the case of May, Bridge Making Equities, because you know their results were published last week, I believe it was Wednesday. You saw a massive trade of about 77 million units, which is about uh, around 700 million dollars. Happened on last week or Thursday. And you know, that's just showing you that when you see these happen by these different parties, you should actually look and say, What does this mean? In the case of elite, people are saying Steven is very bullish and gives it a, gives it a very good price. Because when I saw that trade occurred, I was like, wait, what? It occurred at 1259 on the prior Friday, and you could actually see Excel Investments Inc., who is the number one shareholder's actual stake on the sell queue. So if you had a order in the queue at the time for your lead at two dollars fifty seven, it would have been filled. You got a discount. It would be up almost one hundred percent in less than just two weeks. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting to see what's going on with the lead. Mm-hmm. Let me bring up the chart. Just give me a second. I was just trying to look up the chart really quickly. I see that it's up twenty one percent for today. Share look, at the, look at the amount going. It's gone up for the month. That's what you should look at. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bring it up right now. So here we go. Sharing my screen. You seeing it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Scroll down here. So it's up to 4, 4, 4.34 today. So up 21% today. This would be the trade that we're talking about at 2.58 on April 8th. Mm-hmm. So this was that large volume, 35 million shares. And the price, $2.58. And you see what has been happening since then. It's just going up and up and over a slight dip on Thursday and then up to 434 today. They said to look at the last month because, yeah, it's been around the scroll down a little further. Just it's scroll been down around the $3 range. range all of March. And then it's that dip with that big. Um, it's a, it's a black trade in the sense. But yeah. All right. So let's look at one month. Here just we scroll go. down a little you see below. You see the actual information on the screen below. Telling how much this gone up by for what the yeah, month right here. So you see so 52 week range, two dollars fifty cents to four dollars sixty cents. And a month to date and year to date up 43 percent. Quarter to date, same year to date up 52 percent. In this two and weeks, we, look at Lila. Yeah. Moves, man. But um you know, the, 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 the investing public, the investing public, one, I think they need to consult their brokers sometimes. Uh, what I realize that there, we have been a, we have seen significant rush on selected securities over the last several weeks, you know. And I think people are moved many times uh, in the absence of sound fundamental financial information, they are moved by other information, you know. And I think there are quite a few securities that have moved significantly over the last few weeks that are grossly overpriced. That is, you can buy them. There's nothing wrong with buying them, but you must, the investing public should remember that. When you buy on the cusp, I hope I'm using the right term, of a price rise, it means that you must prepare yourself to hold the security. So if like what, Clive? Uh, which, which ones is grossly overpriced? Well, okay, okay. Let me not use the word grossly overpriced. Let me be very, very politically correct. <laughs> yeah. Stocks that have moved up. 200, 300, 400 percent. Now we can look at the fundamentals, but I like to say to investing public, when a company comes public, the 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 the, the significant shareholder, the principals are trying to get the best price possible, and they will price that stock at a point where they believe that this is the maximum price that fundamentally the company is valued. Or I can, if I can get squeezed a little bit more, I will. You see, then when a stock is listed and trades. 
in the space of a week or two or three, 300, 400 percent. When a stock in the space of a few months of being listed is trading 800 percent above its listing price, it means that yes, it has raised capital, billion dollars plus. Yes, it has opened new outlet. Yes, the product uh, expanded its product range. But you must ask yourself, how long will it take for this price that I've just paid for this company? How long will the company have to produce? Will it take the company to produce revenues and profit to justify the price that I'm paying? No, for this company. It came public a few weeks ago. It is now trading 300, 400 percent above its listed price. Do I believe that within a year's time, the revenue can grow and profit and other valuation metric by three, four hundred percent to justify that price I'm paying now? So I just want, it's just to invite the public to speak to your broker many times. When you're rushed, speak to your broker. Get advice, valuation advice from a broker when you're rushing into the market. When you see a stock price running up so much, you really have to stop, think and say, am I getting good value? When I pay this price, how long will I have to wait for the company to generate revenue that justifies the valuation, you know? Um, and again, we encourage and we know that the market is long-term and we're buying for with long-term projections in mind, but you're locking up the capital. That's what you're doing. You're locking up the capital if you don't want to sell and realize losses, you see? Mm -hmm. You're locking up the capital in a market that is just coming out of COVID where their prices were depressed during COVID and there are some good values out there that is not yet, has not yet begun to move, you're locking up capital that you could have to put into some of these Panjam, JMB, even an NCB at $113, Scotia. You know, there are several other companies that we believe have some good values and you're locking up the capital. I see NCB dropped below $100. I don't even know where they are now. I haven't been following. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Fell, it fell to $91 at one mm -hmm. point. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, but, um, yeah, I, I like the points that you are making there, and um, Clive, and that is exactly why, as you said, we need mm. to consult our licensed financial advisor before yes. making decisions. Gary, Gary said, yeah. are you talking about the inadvertent FOMO created by us <laughs> watching this? <laughs> <laughs> Let me not say anything. FOMO, of course, meaning fear of missing out. So, yes, yes, yes. Man, yeah, I yeah. missed the yeah. elite. I missed the elite play. Now I don't want to miss out. So I'm going yes. to tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, <laughs> I think the thing is to catch the trade before it becomes exactly. public. Right now, when we're talking about and it, that's yeah. the trick, and that's the difficulty. Yeah, no, it's not the time to be buying. That right. is the and difficulty. Is is what Dallas says, levels. you can say that again. No fundamentals, right. just emotions. And then yeah. Strong Link says, that's why I cautioned about IPOs and APOs earlier. A lot of speculatory moves were there. The mm. sharks will eat the minnows. Mm. And yes. then Jano pointing out, Elite's earnings have declined by 35% year over year the past five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. but when you look at the valuation metric for, for you know, let, here's the thing. Mr. Gooden is think he has a long-term strategic objective. His objective might be different from me. You see? Right. So, and he's the chairman of the company. Yes, he knows what is happening, but he's thinking long-term. He's not thinking a year down the road. Many people who bought it into the rush, they're buying, hoping that they can let it go within a few months or a year. But they might just, you know, you know, get a little shake, you know, a little shake up there. You see, so Mr. Gooden's objective is different from many other investors. That's true. That's know? a good point. Yeah, yeah. He's really thinking very long term. He's looking at the long term strategic direction, and it has good potential. In a car. let me tell you one reason what I like to do. And before we look at the numbers, which are a little bit technical, and many people don't understand, what I like to do is look at what is happening in the whole national economic landscape and health. The government, if you notice, many companies are in the government. They are now having life and health insurance for various sectors of the economy. Sajikor, the tourism, uh, you know, health plan that's between Sajikor and the government just implemented. The government want to come in and expand the national insurance scheme, a health scheme. They've been speaking about a health scheme for the longest while. So all these things can help a company like Elite. You know, you're going for insurance, you're going for a certain type of coverage for your children and your family. You might have to go to this and that type of test. Uh, if government has no health, you uh, some form of universal health coverage for the population of Jamaica, because many of them are not insured in terms of health, um, then that means that people can now 
get the diagnostic valuation that they will need to stay healthy and to feel healthy you know so it can has it has potential but how long are you what is your investment horizon are you mm -hmm. willing to buy that sock and hold it for the next five years when really and truly your intention is to let it go to make a gain hopefully within a year or so you know if that is the intention and also you're going to lock up so much of your capital you need a diversified basket are you going to lock up so much of your capital when right now there's a lot of opportunity still in the marketplace especially especially those companies that have declined in prices but fundamentally have not done so so badly during the covid period so prices are really low you know you're missing out on those opportunities you know I have so, richie reynolds yes this is my richie saying elite has great potential and that's what Gooden is buying into the profits mm -hmm. today will not be tomorrow's profit <laughs> one final comment on elite Kalila. uh just for context elite is actually looking mainly to the international market which is why they mm -hmm. probably are over the moon right now because they of the ian fleming international airport so their location in that part of the of the island actually is what they're targeting towards health tourism so you know they're actually speaking right. The international insurance and you see the, providers. The, the flights now coming in from American Airlines, commercial yes. flights to Ian Fleming. Exactly. So they're actually looking at the international market in that space. So they're talking to health insurance providers. So when persons come to their facilities, they can get their use insurance pr products. And the thing is, if you've seen the cost of American healthcare versus healthcare in the region, mm -hmm. and that's why we'll come. I said, if you understand the cost of healthcare in the USA versus in the region. You understand why women, for example, come down to this region to get Brazilian boat lifts or, you know, other procedures. The cost is much different, even by dental checkup. Yep, absolutely. All right. So I wanted to talk about Price Mart and I wanted to talk about AMG results. But looking at the time, I don't think we have time because I absolutely have to talk about Twitter. I see Keisha Art is smiling because she knows I'm coming to her. <laughs> what is going on with Elon Musk, your favorite billionaire, and Twitter? All right, so it's like days of our life, like I'm watching us. So yeah, it is. This is what happens when you are amassed with wealth. You can just buy what you feel to buy. Uh, Twitter has been the platform of free speech. And so Elon Musk putting in a bid to buy Twitter is him wanting to, to step in. A lot of people have been saying, does he want to take over the platform so that he can now openly express his views without any form of censorship? Others see it as poor management by the Twitter board and their senior management team and Elon Musk coming in to kind of save the day. But the board responded with a poison pill, which you mentioned earlier, in that they are putting a policy saying, well, okay, Elon, you're here, hostile person looking to take over the company. If you buy more than 15% ownership within the company, we're going to implement a clause where existing shareholders can buy at a discount thereby they'll be diluting what you own and you will no longer be the majority shareholder so they put that clause into place jack dorsey who was past ceo of twitter he has come out also saying well you know twitter has always suffered from this poor management problem so you know adding more more into the mix there with what's going on and then elon musk coming forward much like how we had with stephen good and Eve. His move has inspired other private equity firms to put their hat in the ring to say, you know what, maybe I need to be buying Twitter as well. And so we had this um, tech private equity firm, Toma Bravo, they are putting a bid to acquire Twitter as well. So lots of things going on there. Again, with Twitter, that trade would have already passed. The price movement has already occurred on that. And we're in you now that whole series of debates between management and the potential buyers of the company. Can we make money from this? I believe some of that opportunity has already passed because the trade would have been to do it right on the day when the announcement was made before all of the information would have been priced in. But as it unfolds, we're gonna have more volatility in the Twitter stock price. And so we can be looking to get some money, some trading opportunities from that movement as well. And I'd like to just add to that debate and say that, you know, persons are still making money off of the whole Twitter saga because you have options. You can either yeah. use a call or a put. So Yeah, so you couldn't be playing either side very risky because you'd be buying a call option when you think the price is going to go up very Well, the thing price. is, you have to buy a call option. You can always sell a call option. Right. But again, that carries margin requirements. Not everybody's pocket is that tall. You need that 25 <laughs> I, I agree with that. 
Not everybody can kind of say, yeah, let me go there. But I mean, you could even go up buying a put option if you expect the prices to come down. So you can play lots of volatility, lots of risk. Talk to your financial advisor before you step in. <laughs> yeah, sure. hey, yeah. I was trying to find a skit that I saw earlier today about the whole Twitter thing that I could play for you, but I can't I can't find it. It was so yeah. funny that somebody was acting as Elon. It was if I find it, I'll post it later on my page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's been, like I said, days of our lives. And like you mentioned, Keisha, the time was before, and we've been talking about this for a few weeks now. So, uh, but even though you say maybe the opportunity has passed, Elon hasn't actually bought Twitter yet. I mean, no. he, he has a stake. He wants right. to. And then now there's a larger investment than a, a larger investor than him. Other people are putting their hats in the ring, like you mentioned. There may, what do you think, David and Chris? Volatility there may still be some opportunities there because if yeah. he does, if he is successful with the bid, you'd want to be a shareholder because you get you're getting a premium on what the share price currently is. Right. Um, so he's, he's trying to buy it at fifty-four dollars twenty cents a share. Assuming then the price goes back up to 54, it's at 46 well, something. Well, and, uh -huh. It doesn't have to go there, remember. If the bid is successful, you get paid the price that is being offered. It doesn't right. have to go to the price. But then you get delisted because he's taking the company price. No, but remember, you're getting paid for the shares that are already listed anyway. So you get yeah, the share price. My thing on it is short period of time from 46 to 54 there's a lot of volatility in between there there's also you would have to contend with will elon be successful or can another bidder come in that's willing to pay even more than 54 dollars a lot's going on and so i personally play to the volatility of the news and, and take advantage of that if apple comes into the mix and apple actually is there was this cash in that would actually become fun yes. because forty-five billion dollars is not a you know, cookie cookie dough. That's some really serious cheddar. So any fund that is going to go in or any company that's going to try and try and overthrow Elon's bid has to come in some money and has to come heavier than him. Remember, you can't just sell Twitter when you sell shares and just be like, oh, let's do that. Remember, I thought I thought a stock for is actually in the mix again. So that's also consideration. All right, so I found the video that I was looking yeah. for. So Let's... let me share it with you. Just a little, a little humorous take on it. Uh... Hey, listen, I just bought nine percent of your company. You're gonna have to start listening to what I have to say. Oh, Elon, you're gonna need at least fifteen percent if you want to boss us around. Oh, why didn't you just say so? I'll just buy more. You know what? Actually, why don't you just save your money and come join our board of directors? That way you can see how we're running the business and we'll even consider your suggestions. Okay. Yeah, that works for me. And a small thing, being part of the board of directors, you can never hold more than 14.9% of our outstanding shares. Oh, so that means I can never tell you what to do. Nah, I don't want to join the board. Oh, on second thought, Twitter, I don't actually want to buy 15% of your company. Oh, thank God. For a minute there, we thought you were going. Instead, I'll buy all of it too. Oh. I'll pay cash, 43 billion. Take it or leave it. Twitter. Hey, listen, I just bought 9% of your company. Yeah, so that was the video <laughs> I was referring yeah. to. Money talks. I hope there was money to go to Take it or leave it, 43 billion cash. Take it or leave it. Goldman Sachs actually had Goldman Sachs about the whole deal with Elon and Goldman Sachs is a price target saying that it's $30 is the quote unquote best price target in terms of the company's value, but yet they're saying that Elias offering is too low. So in one month, you're saying that Elias should offer more money, and then another month, you're saying that the status should actually be at $30. So which is it? Hmm. These are the days of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> like sand through the hourglass. <laughs> Yeah. I want to thank you, Clive, Keisha, David. We didn't get to all our topics today, but it was a great conversation. Thanks for your contribution. Thanks, Kalila. Thank you for having us. Until next Bye. time. And stick with us, viewers. I'm going to take a few more of your comments. I see quite a lively discussion going on in the chat. So stick with us. I'll be right back. And to the analysts was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers.
Hey, money makers! You're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KalilaReynolds.com/store to order your T-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. Let's get this money. All right, let me take a few of your questions uh, towards the end. As the rich is saying, health tourism is another huge opportunity. Rich, you would say that since you are in the medical industry. <laughs> Uh, let's see who else. Natty wanted to know if anyone has feedback on clean and renewable energy. Jano commenting if NCB market, uh, if NCB capital markets own so much, and then Gooden also buys into it, isn't that insider trading? Jano, remember he's also chairman of Elite Diagnostics. So um, I don't. Let me not comment on that. I'm not going to say anything more. Stronglink says a lot of blue chip bargains are currently there, but speculators running down IPOs and APOs, pulling some unsophisticated investors with them. Beware. And then Blue Collar Finance making a point. He says no one is talking about the sell side of Elite. One co-founder has retired, tired, and just wants to go home. So somebody, right, if Stephen bought... 35 million shares is because 35 million shares were available and that's because somebody else sold 35 million shares, one of the directors, and that was reported on the Jamaica Stock Exchange's website. So yeah, there is that point. Thank you, Blue Collar Finance. Natty again wanting to know about the future of electric cars in Jamaica. Natty, if you didn't watch that episode of Taking Stock, it was about two, three weeks ago where we spoke to the co-founders of Flash Motors which is a company founded by two Canadian Jamaicans or Jamaican Canadians, however you want to call them. And they are looking to launch Flash Motors in Jamaica, which is a company that sells electric vehicles in Jamaica. So watch that episode of Taking Stock. Gary Lawrence says, I can't wait for Musk's Starlink to be available over in Jamaica. It will be game changing, immediate high-speed internet covering every inch of Jamaica. Remember, we also spoke about Rock Mobile. A few weeks ago, I did that interview with uh, Mr. Bowen, Bruce Bowen from Rock Mobile. So that's another one. I see you guys liked my, uh, like the skit that I posted earlier about uh, Elon, which was from the page Investing, what was the page again? Investing Simplified. So you can follow Investing Simplified on Instagram for more humorous takes like that on various aspects of the trading space. I want to thank you for tuning in yet another week. Glenroy Shirley says Elon has another power play. If he sells all his Twitter stock, then the stock will lose value dramatically, which will cause others to sell. Hmm. You know, Elon is an interesting fellow. He saw what he did with Dogecoin. I felt like he just really hyped up Dodge and Bitcoin too. He just really hyped up these things. And then just with one simple tweet, the power he has because so many people follow what he does to the T. So yeah, Glenroy, he may well have ulterior motives that Elon Musk, he's somebody to, to, to really watch carefully. So like I was saying, thank you for joining us yet another week here on Taking Stock Live. It was my pleasure hosting you, my pleasure being uh, the facilitator of these types of discussions. If you're brand new to investing, check out my Investing for Beginners Masterclass at kalilareynolds.com slash masterclass. Also subscribe to my newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. You're going to get what's hot in business in your inbox every Wednesday. And on Sunday, we have your recaps. You also get investment alerts whenever there's a new IPO, APO, investment opportunity, and so on. You will get them in your email inbox. So subscribe at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter. The links are in the description box below. And so are the links to participate in the Kingston Properties APO, you can do so via VM Wealth's IPO Edge, I think is what it's called, but the link is right there. You can also read the prospectus and a reminder as well that there are five other selling agents for it. But of course, read the prospectus first, familiar, familiarize yourself with it fully and consult with your licensed financial advisor. Hit that like button on this video so other people know that this is a good video for them to watch. And I'll see you here next week. Same time, same place. Let's get this money.
this money. <laughs> <laughs>